Right, the month of May just started. And just like that, one more month will be right at the half mark of 2018. It seems it was yesterday that we embarked in a new year. Now the new year is almost becoming middle-aged, and pretty soon it's going to be the old, and the 2019 will be upon us. Amen? All right. The gospel is powerful to change any man or woman, any situation. It's powerful to heal any disease, to fix any marriage, to mend any broken heart. The gospel of Jesus is so powerful that it can change a whole nation. The gospel's power can even resurrect what is dead. Amen? Beloved friends, I can assure you that no matter what situation you may bring to God, He can fix it. There is nothing too difficult or nothing impossible for God. It is impossible for God not to attend a broken heart. It's impossible for God not to forgive those who repent. And it doesn't matter what the situation is. God sent his only begotten son not to bring judgment or accuse the world. Not that we didn't deserve. But Jesus came to impact our lives, not with his mighty power, but he came as a loving, merciful, and graceful God. Hallelujah. An encounter with Jesus will impact every single person. Everyone that encounters Jesus is impacted. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a real encounter with him. The only difference from one person to another is how they decide to live after this encounter. But every single one that encounters Jesus is impacted. Powerfully impacted. There is nobody, I mean nobody that comes in front of Jesus, that encounters Jesus, that is not impacted. There is, this is impossible. Well, you might say, well, but that person and so-and-so and this and that I heard. I'm not talking, of, again, about religion. And it all depends how the person sees it. Jesus is real. And as, you know, we talk about Christianity, religion, and all that, the real religion is to love God with all your hearts and to love, you, you know, your neighbor as yourself. The real religion is to seek God first in his kingdom and his justice. Wow, that, that, this is pretty tough, man. That's why... A lot of people changed the message of the gospel, changed the name of Jesus, changed the name of Jesus, changed love, uh, changed mercy and grace to dollars, to power, to success. You know, a good church today is not a church filled with the Holy Spirit, but it's a church that has more people in it. And the richer, the better. Tell you what, man, these people are crazy. You know why? Because God does not need dollars. We need dollars. You know, humans, we need to pay bills and things like that. But the Bible says that God is the God of gold and silver. He does not need checks in heaven. He does not need money or whatever in heaven. He has everything. He's God. And just as we sing here today, and as the word says, as God speak, let there be light. There was light. You know, the Bible says that God said, let the earth bring forth every kind of the creatures and animals. Did you ever stop to notice that? So the earth started to producing animals. So there is evolution right there, if you want to, please, if you will. But everything came to evolute to what God meant for them to be. And as God created man from the dust, 
of the earth. He created us his own image and likeness. And the devil has dis, uh, destroyed, has changed this image. Amen? But I can assure you that every person that encountered Jesus are impacted one way or the other. The whole month of May, we will be talking about the impactful encounter with Jesus. Amen? In today's message, we will talk about Saul of Tarsus and his encounter with Jesus. And today's title message is On the Road to Damascus. Amen? Everybody knows Paul the Apostle. The Apostle. You know that Paul wrote basically the New Testament. You take the four Gospels, you take Revelation and a few other books, and, and the rest was written by Paul. Many used to argue that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Nowadays, they may say it's somebody else. To me, it doesn't matter what hand wrote. What it matters is who mouth spoke the word of God. Amen? I'm not taking credits from this great man of God that made themselves available, that they lived their life to worship God. But today I don't want to talk about the Apostle Paul, but I want to talk about Saul of Tarsus. Do you know who Saul of Tarsus was? Okay, that was the old man that lived in Paul's body. Today, driving route on a good day would take about five hours driving and about 225 uh, 25 miles. In a, in a straight line is about 140 miles from Jerusalem to Damascus. Back then, it would probably take anywhere from two and a half days to six days. And Saul of Tarsus was not alone. He was going to Damascus to arrest people. So probably he had a small army with him to arrest the Christians and bring back to Jerusalem to be punished. I don't know what they had. If it was horses from Egypt, if they had camels, donkeys, he was prepared. Who was Paul of Tarsus? Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee, a student of Gamaliel, a very important scholar and teacher of the Jewish law. A very respected man. Saul was a Roman citizen, but being a Hebrew of Hebrew, born of the tribe of Benjamin, he was born between 5 B.C. to 5 A.D., most likely near 5 A.D., So Paul was a very, je uh, not jealous, zealous, zealous man of the law. He learned the law on a foot on one of the greatest men in the Jewish law. He knew the law, the prophets. He loved God, but he didn't know how to. So he used religion to try to please God. But religion messed him up. Right around 30 to 33 AD, he starts to persecute the followers of the way, which was Christians. So if you please have a Bible open in the book of Acts of the Apostle, chapter 7. If you don't have, just listen. I will read for you. Chapter 7. Verse 57 and 59, the, the last verses of chapter 7. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him. Oh, hold on. This is wrong. No. Go to. Oh, yes. It's right. Correct. It's 7. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. 
His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. So they were persecuting the Christians. And a young Saul, in all his might, was standing there. He probably was part of that tribunal where they accused the young uh, Stephen or Stephen to stone and as they were stoned him, they put their coats on the feet of the mighty Saul, and he, in agreement, never stopped them. Now turn a few pages to chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill. That's what the word says. Not to imprison, but to kill kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So this is, this is Saul of Tarsus. So here we see a very religious man, a violent man. He didn't care if it was men or women. If they were of the way, they would be bound with chains and be prosecuted. Are you of the way? Do you believe in Jesus? Are you afraid to die for Jesus? A lot of people died because of the way. Some crucified, others lost their heads, and some killed by hungry lions. What is our perse persecution today? Your co-worker doesn't like you? Oh, poor little thing. Who is prosecuting you? It is an outside threat? Or is it your mind tricking you? Is it the devil lying to you saying that you're a loser? Because the Bible says you are more than a conqueror. Well, our brothers and sisters had a real prosecution in Saul of Tarsus. The religious leaders in the Roman Empire. Prosecution that killed many but also made many stronger and made the gospel to spread and bring salvation to the corners of the earth. You know, it's funny because we say the, the earth is round, but the Bible says the earth has corners. It's weird, isn't it? Maybe we live in a box and we don't know. Trial and tribulation makes you grow. Did you know that? I think I gave, uh, I don't know if it was uh, Greg, a, a video. I had to put this in here. Does anybody know how a lobster grows? I'm sure you don't care how lobster grows. You just care how it gets into your plate, right? <laughs> but this is interesting. The lobster is a soft and mushy animal that lives inside a rigid shell. And that rigid shell does not expand. So how does the lobster grow? Well, as the lobster grows, that shell becomes very confining. And the lobster feels under pressure and uncomfortable. So it goes under a rock formation to hide from predatory fish. Cast off the shell and produces a new one. Now, eventually, the new one becomes uncomfortable, so it goes back under the rock, and the lobster repeats this numerous, numerous times. The stimulus for the lobster to be able to grow is that it feels uncomfortable. Now, if the lobster had doctors, it would never grow. Because as soon as the lobster gets uncomfortable, it would go to the doctor and get a violent 
gets a Percocet, feels fine, never gets off the shelf. So we need to realize that times of stress is also times that signals for growth. If we use adversities properly, we can grow through adversities. So they were getting persecuted. They were getting killed, people. And they started to, whenever they could, run. And they ran to the corners of the earth. And that was their time. But going back, in the time of persecution, the gospel had its biggest growth in history. But right around 33 to 36 A.D., Saul of Tarsus, thinking he would go to Damascus and imprison more followers of the way, as he's getting closer to the city of Damascus, someone, or he encounters someone who changed his life forever. Acts 22, verse 1. This is Saul trying to defend himself. Brothers and esteemed fathers, Paul said, listen to me as I offer my defense. When they heard him speaking in their own language, the silence was even greater. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia. And I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel as his student. I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. And I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify that this is so. For I received letters from them to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the followers of the way from there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. As I was on the road approaching Damascus about noon, a very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus the Nazarene, the one you are persecuting. The people with me saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice speaking to me. I asked, what should I do, Lord? And the Lord told me, get up and go into Damascus. And there you will be told everything you are to do. I was blinded by the intense light and had to be led by the hand to Damascus by my companions. So right around noon, Jesus encounters Paul, or Paul encounters Jesus. And his life was changed from persecution to persecuted. Now, as I said earlier, every single person person that encounters Jesus Christ of Nazareth is impacted. But Paul could say, no, I don't care about you. I'm going to still kill these people. But that would be his decision. But Paul is no stupid. He felt the voice of the one that was talking to him. And he let religion fall to the ground. And he said, I will hear this voice. Because this voice is different than the voices I heard before. And if you don't know the story, Paul got blinded. They took him into the sea of the masses where he would persecute the Christians. As soon as he got there, he knew the Lord God, the law and everything. So he was fasting and praying to God what? Should he do, do? Another man fearing God was also praying to do God's will. And God told him, Ananias, there is a man, Saul of Tarsus, he is, uh, at the uh, street, uh, straight street. Go over there and pray for him. Because he had the vision that a man, Ananias, would come and pray for him. 
wait, Lord, God, uh, <clears throat> hold on. Are we talking about the, mm, that guy, Paul, I mean, Saul of Tarsus, the one that's been killing us? Yes, that, that one. So you heard about him. Go over there and pray for him. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, God. I don't think he, <laughs> he wants to kill us. You know, like kill us. And God said, no, he's not about to do that because he's an instrument in my hand. And he will see how much he must suffer for this ministry. I don't want to go any further. I just wanted to tell you who Paul was because you knew who he is now. You have heard about him. You have heard his letters. You have heard about his teachings. So I want to end my message just the way I started the gospel is powerful to change any man or woman. Any situation is powerful to heal any disease, to fix any marriage, to mend any broken heart. The gospel of Jesus is so powerful that it can change a whole nation. The gospel's power can even resurrect what is dead. I want to invite you to, to stand up. And I want to be very short in my message today. You know, for a preacher, it's very good to spend time studying, writing, reading, so he would have something to speak. And I love to do that. I don't do as much as I should, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't pray as much as I pray. I don't do as much as I do. But I know God and and. I didn't even have to read this, what I prepared last night. Because God already said here. He used Pastor Nair to say, I'm doing something new. What have we preached in this church? Believe. Trust God. Love God with all your heart. Do not be afraid. You know, when Moses died, God called Joshua. He said, be encouraged. I am with you just as I was with Moses. Seek God with all your heart. Ask God, what do you want from me? Look, remember I said about the children's uh, uh, Fifi? Hi, Fifi. Fifi. She loves Salty the Singing Song book. If you have kids, you have to get Salty the Singing Song book. Very good teachings. And there is one episode that, that they have Charity, the church mouth, mouse, the church, the church mouse singer. And Charity, 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 char how do you, Charity, Charity. Charity the church mouth, co mouse comes. And she's going to go to California or somewhere to be a gospel singing star. And she's all excited because she wants to be famous and have servants. Mm -hmm. And that day they're studying Matthew where it says, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you got to be a servant of all. Right, Fifi? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you got to be a servant of all. All, all, all. So Charity doesn't ask God if that's what God wants. Because she says, I'm going to be a gospel star. Why should I pray about it? I'm going to be singing to him. It's not because you're doing something for God. That does not mean it's God's will for your life. Because you might be doing something there and God wants you to do it here. You might be doing here and God wants you to do it there. You might be doing it there this, but God wants you to do that. <laughs> do not assume that whatever you want to do for God is what God wants you to do for Him. But seek God's will in your life. Because as Jesus met Paul, Saul of Tarsus, he first asked her, who are you, 
And he says, I am Jesus. You are persecuting me. Then what was the next question? What do you want me to do? What I ought to do? Go into Damascus and wait there. I will reveal to you. So Paul went to Damascus. You know what happened to Paul? They want to kill him there. Since Damascus, since the encounter, since the road to Damascus, Paul was on the run. And whatever he ran to, he spoke boldly about the gospel. I encourage you to read Acts 9 and then Acts 22. Read 22, 23, 24, 25. And I'll tell you, man, once you start reading that, you're going to read three, four chapters very fast. Amen.